Welcome to a walk in the park with Gil. My name is Gil Penalosa and I was born in Bogota, Colombia, where as head of parks, I led the design and construction of over 200 parks and took a small program called Ciclovia Open Streets and turned it into the world's largest pop-up park. Every Sunday, the city opens 120 kilometers, 75 miles of streets to people and closes them to cars. And then magic happens. Over a million people come out to walk, run, bike, play, and mostly to enjoy meeting each other as equals. 17 years ago, I created 880 Cities, a non-profit organization based in Toronto, Canada, where I live. As of the start of the pandemic, I had worked in three, four, five, 345 cities in all continents. This bi-weekly web talk is a way of giving back, always free, each time with fascinating guests who present on parks and cities. And then we have a dialogue. I team up with 880 Cities and World Urban Parks, where I was elected chair twice and now serve as ambassador. I hope you'll find these bi-weekly sessions interesting and useful. Welcome, Pascal, and welcome, Omar. Uh, today, we are going to have a fascinating session because we are going to learn about Canada Parks and a brand new program that usually when people hear of national parks, they think this is only the conservation areas far away from the cities, gigantic parks. Yes, part of that is what Canada Parks does, but also now Parks Canada has a brand new program on urban parks. And then we're gonna have Omar doing a presentation on the Rouge Park. The Rouge Park is an amazing park in Toronto, in the greater Toronto area, that is about 23 times the size of Central Park. So we are gonna start with Pascal, I ask you to do a short presentation about yourself and then go ahead with your presentation. And then we're gonna have Omar. Uh, keep in mind people that when they are presenting, we don't do chat, but as soon as they stop the presentation, you can do all the chat. As far as the questions, you can put up any questions at any time so that that will help us with the dialogue. So welcome Pascal and Omar. So Pascal, uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us about this fascinating new program of urban parks. Okay, thank you so much. Gail, can, is my sound okay? Perfect. Perfect, perfect. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you for, for having me and uh, providing the space for us to share, for me to share Parks Canada's new National Urban Parks Program. Um, my name is Pascal Sala. I'm joining you from Halifax, Nova Scotia, which is the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, I feel very fortunate. I, I grew up in Halifax um, and I feel very fortunate to call this place my home. My family came to Halifax from Lebanon. And I would say I'm not a typical person, maybe when someone thinks of a Parks Canada employee. I didn't grow up going to um, you know, the wilderness areas way outside the city. It was a pretty city oriented lifestyle growing up. But I was also raised in a family and a culture that has a lot of respect and love for nature. And so urban parks are, I'm really excited um, and honored to have a position working with our new National Urban Parks Program. I am the project manager for a candidate National Urban Park here in Halifax. I'm also supporting on the candidate location in Victoria, British Columbia, so truly coast to coast for me. And, um, and I'm helping to co-lead the development of our new National Urban Parks Policy. Um, so I think this is a really exciting opportunity for conserving nature in cities, um, but also helping to reach and connect with all kinds of people that Parks Canada um, maybe don't always have access to the Parks Canada experience. So I'm going to share my screen here with you. I have a short presentation. I'm going to move through it quite quickly um, because I want to make sure that there's lots of time for questions and conversation at the end and also lots of time for my colleague Omar to be able to present on the Rouge National Urban Park, um, which is really a, a really shining example and a success story that this program really, uh, its roots, I would say, take place at the Rouge. Um, but in terms of the new network of national urban parks, they are a bit more recent. I'll start in 2020, and that's when the, our government announced um, a plan to protect 25% of Canada's land and our oceans by 2025. Um, 
It followed quite quickly with, in 2021, a uh, historic investment of $2.3 billion in Canada's natural legacy, which included $130 million to create a network of national urban parks. Um, and we moved, we started moving really fast from that point. So in August of 2021, we're not even one year into our program, came the uh, official announcement and launch of Parks Canada's new program to support the creation of a network of national urban parks across the country. Um, and when that launch happened, I know maybe some people in government, sometimes when those announcements happen, you know, things are already well advanced. But when we announced the new program for national urban parks, and we were truly announcing our, our starting point. There was just, you know, a couple of us hired to do the team. Um, uh, and we were just getting our feet wet. So truly, we are not even one year into this program, but it's been a very eventful year. Um, national urban parks, this new program, is really seen as the next step for Parks Canada. So we are building on our, our network of national parks, national historic sites, national marine conservation areas, and of course the Rouge as our, our one um, very successful national urban park that does exist. So we do see it as um, you know just online with our other program areas. Um, but as you'll you'll find out, it's it's quite a different program for Parks Canada. I don't think I really need to spend too much time talking about the benefits of urban parks to this audience, but I will highlight the first three on this, this list that we created for our program as a little summary, um, which is protecting nature, connecting people with nature, and supporting reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. These have really emerged as kind of the three, um, let's say, core elements of our program, of our policy, um, that have been resonating really strongly with our partners and with others that we're collaborating with. Um, and so you'll see that these three benefits in particular um, are emerging as, as key components of all the work that we're doing and being integrated into um, all the decisions that we are taking moving forward. So our program is funded for five years and we're already one year in. Um, so what we plan to do in that five year period, um, we've started to develop a, a new policy for our network of national urban parks. Um, we've had a number of, uh, it's national stakeholder consultation sessions or engagement sessions, I call them, because we really are in this early exploratory stage. So really we're exploring and discussing and engaging um, with much more to come in that area. And um, we've started to identify some potential national urban parks, which have national significance. That's really what we're looking for in potential candidate locations and also places where it makes sense for the government of Canada to come in and play a role. Um, by 2026, we do plan to designate up to six new national urban parks with one, likely one will be administered by Parks Canada. So that's a key distinction. Um, these, most of these new national urban parks will not be like the Rouge, so to speak, where Parks Canada is the lead administrator um, and running the park. There will likely be one more following that model, but all the others will have unique and different models. So this is really a very creative and flexible program um, that we are launching. And we also see it as the beginning. So in the next five years, we're hoping to, our goal is to really create a foundation that will anchor a network that can expand over time, grow and expand um, and flourish um, by working together over time. It's a very ambitious program and it's a program that we understand, we recognize, you know, this is not something that we can do ourselves or that we even want to do ourselves. We're working from day one, this, we've taken a collaborative approach. Um, again, building on the really collaborative nature at the Rouge and the work that they do there. So we're working very closely with um, our other levels of government, including cities, provinces, and Indigenous governments. We're working very closely with conservation groups, NGOs, community groups, and also um, at our candidate locations, you know, much broader than just conservation groups. A lot of urban-centered community-type groups, because there are lots of different interests and opportunities when you get into the urban park space which is something that, of course, is, is new to most of us at Parks Canada. So it's been um, really exciting to kind of engage in these collaborations. I do want to highlight um, one partner group, which is our Indigenous partners. We do see Indigenous partners as really very key partners. Across Parks Canada, we have very special um, partnerships with Indigenous peoples, and um, but there's no exception with our new National Urban Parks Program. So we plan to work and have started working nationally um, with Indigenous groups, very, very early stages of our discussions, but, you know, looking at opportunities for, you know, how we can work together to roll out this new policy 
um, developed this program. We are working at a, a nation to nation level. So that is the framing of all of these relationships. And locally, um, our conversations are, are much more advanced in some cases where we you know, started engaging the local indigenous communities. Um, at this stage, really looking at treaty, treaty sorry, and uh, rights holders um, at specific candidate park locations. Um, and working really hand in hand with them as we move forward with these projects. A really unique, as I've kind of mentioned, um, one model for a national urban park is like the Rouge, which is a federally administered place and you know, would be the same for um, our national parks and many of our national historic sites. So that's one model which the new national urban parks may follow. But other models also include places that are administered um, by others. So that could be you know, municipalities, provinces, indigenous governments, maybe private land owners. Um, and the third model, which at our candidate location seems to be the most common, are co-management models. So bringing together um, a group of partners and exploring a governance model where under one name, we all work together to govern the space and manage the space. Um, so lots of different models it's not a, we recognize this will not be a one size fits all situation. We, we figured that out pretty early when we launched this program. Um, and by 2026, it'll be exciting to see just exactly which different models emerge um, for the, the six parts that we plan to designate and, um, and how they will um, locally, what the decisions are made in terms of how best can these places be governed. Um, I also mentioned, so simultaneous, and this is a bit, unique for government. So at the same time in which we launched our program last August, we also launched the, the beginning of our policy work. I would say a more typical approach for the government of Canada is to develop a policy and then that policy informs the, the program which follows. But for us, because this is such a new area of work and because we were you know, using this collaborative model, um, we launched both processes simultaneously and the plan is over this five year period, for them to feed each other. So we're learning from each experience. The policy helps to inform the program and what's happening on the ground comes back and informs the policy. We do plan to have our first full draft policy um, within the next year, but we're planning to kind of keep it as slightly as an evergreen product, just in case there are some really significant new learnings that happen between now and like 2025, 20, 26, before we, we kind of finalize it. Um, but as I mentioned, what has emerged are these kind of three key elements is the, the foundation or the core integrated elements of our policy, which are nature, connecting Canadians with nature, and reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. Um, in terms of a, a policy framework, we are looking to identify maybe a foundational requirement that all national urban parks would need to have from, I guess, kind of day one. They have it or they have the potential for it. So for nature, you know, the potential to contribute to our national conservation targets. Um, for connecting people, we're really looking at this point in this phase one of our program at proximity to some of our largest population centers across the country. And for reconciliation, really an, an openness and a willingness for everyone at the table to work really collaboratively with our indigenous, with indigenous peoples towards shared priorities and supporting the leadership of indigenous peoples in these, these places and, and in this process. Um, this is not just a program to designate a park. We're really looking at opportunities. We're working together. We can enhance um, and expand the places that have been identified. And our policy is being developed in that way. So identifying some baselines, but then also identifying kind of our, our ambitions of where we all hope to move together um, and how, you know, in creating a, a policy that can guide that process. Where Parks Canada will not own these lands, um, because, you know, you can't legislate in Canada what you, what you don't own. And so the policy will be really incredibly important. It will be our foundational guiding document um, to help guide this program and shape this program um, where there won't be legislation, um, at least in the early stages. I mentioned that we have identified some sites across the country. Um, so I'll just quickly share those with you. We are working in the greater Victoria area, uh, Edmonton, in the Miwasan Valley in Saskatoon, Winnipeg, Windsor, Ontario, and Halifax, Nova Scotia. So west to east, we are, we're hitting the different coastlines. Um, we have just begun ex kind of some early discussions also with the city of Montreal. Um, so that's where we are kind of at, at year one. Those are our active projects. Not a, you know, a set in stone. So it's not definitive that all of these places will end up having national urban parks. We are in exploratory kind of exploratory phases in every one of these projects to date. 
Um, we are working on an intake process so that other places can still be identified. Um, so again, lots of flexibility is being built into every element of this program. And then moving forward, I guess just give you a sense of where we're going with our National Urban Parks Program. Um, the very early phase of designation is called pre-feasibility. And so, like I said, in those, those jurisdictions I just mentioned, we are implementing pre-feasibility study, studies across the board, which includes kind of, again, those collaborative exploratory conversations with key partners, um, engaging local stakeholders is a really important part of that work. And then some um, key studies and assessments that give us that background knowledge so that together as partner groups, a decision can be made of, you know, yes or no, this is a, a good candidate location to proceed into more detailed planning. Um, we are very actively working on outreach, engagement, and collaboration with Indigenous partners, um, kind of national groups, but then locally as well. And um, we have actually, as part of our team, um, one of our more recent hires is the development of an Indigenous uh, relations kind of sub-branch within our team. So we're really fortunate to have some experts in that area who are working specifically on national urban parks for us. Um, we are working on the development of that first draft policy. So I think, you know, if you watch our website, we are just getting ready to launch a, a more comprehensive website on the Parks Canada website for the National Urban Parks Program. And so we will be sharing um, updates on that policy development as that progresses. Um, we are developing that intake process, which is particularly important because this past year, um, the Minister of Environment here in Canada, um, his mandate letter indicated an expansion of our program. So from six National Urban Parks by 2026, potentially to 15 national urban parks by 2030. So we are actively working on you know, how to, um, to roll out that, that expansion and exploring that with our minister's office. Um, and so there likely will be a lot more news to come on that front um, in terms of supporting that expanded program and that timeline to 2030. So that is, that is it for me. I'm just gonna stop sharing the screen. And Thank I you, think Pascal. the plan is to turn it over, yeah, to Omar now. Thank you, Gil. Thank you, very, very interesting. Uh, now we, we have a few questions, but I think let, let's leave it at the end. We have a dialogue. If anybody has any questions, please uh, write the question, the Q&A, and then we'll try to go through as many. So now we're gonna have Omar, but before we go to Omar, uh, I wanna share a very short video that Omar uh, proposed, uh, sent. Uh, and is this one. Uh, Toronto, the Canadian metropolis is renowned for its cultural diversity. More than 200 languages are spoken here and authentic flavors from around the world are just around the corner. But a mere few steps away from this lively city is a place with a rich history and incredibly diverse ecosystems. The Rouge Valley is the ancestral home of many First Nations. The first European settlers arrived in the area in the 1800s and took up farming. Other waves of immigrants from around the world would arrive in succession over the years. But at the beginning of the 20th century, urban encroachment led to a rapid decline in local biodiversity and significant losses in urban farmland threatening the natural and cultural heritage of the valley. Thankfully, Rouge National Urban Park was officially created in 2015 to preserve the land's heritage. Spanning nearly 80 square kilometers in size, it is one of the largest national urban parks in North America. Its rich ecosystems are home to more than 1,700 species, making it one of Canada's most biologically diverse parks. Located only 30 minutes from downtown Toronto, it is the most accessible national park in the country.
The Rouge provides urban dwellers the chance to enjoy Canada's wilderness. adventure awaits and so do memories Rouge National Urban Park is also the only park in the country with a mandate to protect its agricultural heritage built in collaboration with 10 First Nations Rouge National Urban Park is a place where we gather to honor the area's cultural heritage. Great. So now the person that runs the Rouge National Park, Omar Magdari. Omar, thank you very much for joining us. So tell us a bit about yourself and please do the presentation. And then if anybody has any questions, we already have some really, really good questions for Pascal. So if anybody has questions for Omar, please write them in and we'll try to go to as many as possible. Omar, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me, Gil, and great presentation, uh, Pascal. Pascal, I didn't realize that your family's from Lebanon. My mom's from Lebanon, so we'll have to catch up about that sometime. Um, I'm I'm originally from the greater Toronto area. Uh, I've been working for Parks Canada for, I can't believe it, time flies when you're uh, having fun, 19 years. Um, so I moved out west uh, as a younger person, went to school uh, in Victoria, Canada. And then I ended up working for Parks Canada as a student beginning uh, 19, 19 years ago and slowly built, built a career. I, I was originally a biologist. And then about eight and a half years ago, I had the chance to, to come back home uh, to, to work on, on creating Rouge National Urban Park, which I really view as the project of, of a lifetime, the project of my lifetime, and uh, something I really appreciate the opportunity to work on and to work on with so many amazing people including I saw we have Marilyn uh, here today, who's one of our most incredible uh, volunteers for the Rouge and has been for uh, over a decade now. So yeah, I'm the superintendent of the park. I've been in this role for four and a half years and I've been working on this project for eight and a half uh, years. I'm, it's really amazing the work that Pascal and the National Urban Park team are, are doing. It's, it's so great because for so many years, uh, we were the only sort of National Urban Park in, in the in the Parks Canada family of, of places. It's been uh, incredible the amount of uh, momentum that we have now in terms of building out a national urban park network across the country. And, and in many ways, the Rouge is kind of a pilot for how it could work in other places or in some cases, how, it's, how it may not work and, and the lessons that we've learned over the years. Um, so just a little bit about Parks Canada. Parks Canada is the world's first uh, National Park Service, been around for 111 years. We have the great honor responsibility uh, of protecting a lot of land, over 450,000 square kilometers of land and inland waters. That's about the size of the country, uh, Sweden. So a massive, massive, massive territory. I just, we just showed this video. Um, one of the things that's really, I think, amazing about the Rouge uh, is is it's kind of the three pillars of, of the mandate here are to pre protect natural, cultural, and agricultural heritage. So that's really unique. Um, it's an urban park, uh, and it, it is very urban, and we really celebrate uh, the urbanity and the urban connections that we have. Um, but it's also, in some ways, a little misleading because it's it's also, uh, in, in many ways, a rural park too. So it, it's the diversity of the park uh, and the diversity of the mandate and our objectives that I really love. Uh, every day is unique and, and we have a very rich and compelling and integrated mandate. Of course, this is a, a lived in landscape and has been for um, countless generations and since time immemorial. Uh, we have over 10,000 years of human history uh, that we try to honor uh, with our relationships with our indigenous partners. In terms of background, so the, the initiative to create a national park in the greater Toronto area actually began in 2011. Uh, and you could say that it goes back several decades before that too, because of a grassroots uh, movement to protect uh, a landscape that was going to be developed for a highway at one point in time in the 1980s. 
So in developing uh, Rouge National Urban Park, we undertook the most significant public consultation in Parks Canada's history at the time, engaging with over 20,000 people in over 200 community groups and different levels of government to establish a vision for the park and its uh, foundational management plan and to work on land assembly agreements uh, with many different levels of government and organizations and agencies and jurisdictions. Uh, you know, in terms of where the park is located, uh, it's, it's uh, in the Eastern Greater Toronto area. So for folks not familiar with the area, like we're about 30 minutes from downtown Toronto. And it is one of the largest urban parks in, in the world. And it's a shining example of the possibilities when all levels of government uh, work together in partnership, in collaboration with a common vision and a common objective and all levels of government and, and uh, many, many indigenous partners have, have worked on this and put a lot of blood, sweat and tears in, into making this possible. Uh, and it really is kind of a miracle that such a large area of land uh, remains protected in, in Canada's largest metropolitan area. So in terms of the, the, the Canadian network of protected areas, like typically as somebody that grew up in the greater Toronto area and Mississauga, now, I didn't really have uh, immediate access to, to a Parks Canada place. And usually for folks that live in our larger cities in, in the country, there are a few exceptions, but generally speaking, it's several hours, if not several days to, to get access to a national park. So this was meant, obviously Parks Canada was very interested in the Rouge Valley to, to try to uh, afford the highest level of protections for these incredibly sensitive and incredible lands. But there's also an aspect of removing barriers of accessibility so that folks um, of all walks of life would have access to, to nature and the outdoors uh, and to, to a Parks Canada place who otherwise may not have such immediate access uh, to, to a Parks Canada place. And, and certainly that, that's always been the case in the greater Toronto area, uh, which has never had uh, immediate access to, to a protected place uh, that's run by Parks Canada until the creation of, of, of this park. Um, so yeah, here's just another like snapshot. And one of the things that's really great about the park is it's hyper connectivity uh, through public transportation and through active transportation and through cars as well. Uh, there are literally thousands of entry points for the park. Uh, Jill and I were talking just before the presentation, he was asking about our current levels of visitation and we're now over a million people, uh, but it's actually very challenging to, to develop those metrics. Uh, in comparison to our more traditional national parks like Banff where there's two gates of entry and you can count every single person that comes into the park. We literally have thousands of entry points. We have backyards that back onto the park. Uh, so it's, it's really interesting uh, from that perspective. But this is, this is a national park that you can access by taking public transit, by taking a commuter train, you can take a subway and a bus. We run a free shuttle to the park on the weekends through a, through a partnership we have with TD Bank and Mountain Equipment Co-op. Um, and the cycling and walking opportunities are, are incredible as well. We're connected to the Trans Canada Trail, the Waterfront Trail. And there's a new trail that's being built from downtown Toronto uh, to the park called the Meadowway, which is a 16 kilometer, kilometer linear trail that goes through hydro corridors. And that's gonna be a real game changer in, in the coming years in terms of improving accessibility to, to the park. There's been a lot on the go. I look at the last eight and a half, almost nine years of working on this project and every single year it's been different. So the first few years, it was really a, about putting in place the foundations, our legislation, our management plan, uh, all our land assembly agreements, all our partnerships and work with our indigenous partners and ensuring that's foundational to everything we do. Then in 2015, um, we actually created the park and we had to start operating it. And the park has grown every single year as new lands transferred to Parks Canada. So I kind of liken this somewhat to like riding a bicycle and trying to change the tire at the same time. It's not easy to do. <laughs> We're still trying to develop the, the park and its programs and policy, put in place the foundational infrastructure. Most of the park doesn't have washrooms. We're still building all our trails, our future visitor center, et cetera. We're trying to operate it responsibly, put in place our conservation programming, our restoration programming, our archeological programming, all the things that make us a, a national federal protected place. 
um, and all the all the uh, all the things we must uphold uh, and the highest possible standards in terms of the protection uh, of wildlife and ecological integrity and cultural heritage, et cetera. At the same time, we're still building and developing uh, the park. So it's it's been it's very fun, and uh, it's also complicated in in a good way. So our our uh, we are we are one of the only sites. I think we're actually the only site in Parks Canada that has its very own dedicated legislation. Uh, so the Rouge National Urban Park Act was passed in 2015. It was amended in 2017 to make it even stronger in terms of ecological protections and protections for farmland and farmers. And um, this is this enables us to have a, a very progressive. Uh, suite of tools to, to manage the park in a, in a really good good way. So we really rely on this on this act as the enabling act to, to, to manage the park. And the policy that supports the act is our management plan, which, which was released in 2019 after seven years of, of public consultation, open houses, uh, visioning sessions with uh, hundreds of partners and thousands of community, community members. So this sets a roadmap for us for the next 10 years in terms of all the trees we're going to plant, all the trails we're going to build, our foundational visitor center, uh, all the indicators of success that we need to have over a 10 year period. Basically, this is the foundational document for the first national urban park in the country and the roadmap ahead for what we're going to build and achieve in, in the first 10 years. Uh, and really the vision for the park is a protected landscape from Lake Ontario in the south of the park uh, to the Oak Ridges Moraine in, in the north with incredibly diverse landscapes that, that dot the, the, uh, the park landscape, natural, cultural, and agricultural uh, from north to south and east to west. We also um, aim to be and aspire to be a premier learn to park where greater Toronto area residents, um, where urban residents where newcomers can, can come and maybe have their first footsteps, if not in nature, then, then in a national park and in a national protected area where folks can learn to camp, where we, we have um, a very rich learn to camp program in the park, learn to hike, learn to paddle, uh, and gain confidence and inspire the next generation of, of folks to uh, learn more about uh, protected areas across Canada and across the world, and maybe become a biologist one day, or become a farmer or, or, or just have that great connection to nature uh, to support mental and physical health, uh, well-being and, and good outcomes in that, in that way. Really foundational to everything we do and so important to, to do right and to, to do right from the beginning is that we set up a, a First Nations advisory circle that's comprised of 10 nations with a historic, cultural, stated and present day interest uh, in the park. And we work uh, with these 10 nations uh, on all aspects of building, establishing and, and operating the park. We're incredibly thankful for these, these relationships. And I'd like to acknowledge that the park is located in the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee and Huron-Wendat peoples who have been the stewards of these lands since time immemorial. We really appreciate working with them in a good way and, and us working together to co-design and develop uh, the park, its trails, its infrastructure, its conservation programs, and its visitor uh, experience programs as well. Uh, in terms of natural heritage, like I think one of the most surprising things for me is how incredibly diverse this the park is. Like, it is a is it a biodiver It's a local biodiversity hotspot and a national biodiversity hotspot. There's now over 200 species that have been documented in the park in terms of plants and animals. We just last year um, published our, our multi-species at risk action plan, which is a five-year plan that talks about uh, and lays out concrete actions for the work we're going to do to conserve these species. Um, since 2014, we planted over 200,000 trees, uh, and, that, and that's part of the Two Billion Trees program that the Government of Canada um, has rolled out in the, in the last couple of years. We have 50,000 more trees we'll be planting um, this year. We've also released over 500 turtles uh, back in the park. We do that every year on National Indigenous Peoples Day on June 21st. 
Prior to this program, there was only seven uh, of these turtles. They're called Blandings turtles left, left in the park. So we're really proud of this program. We do it in partnership with our friends across the street at the Toronto Zoo. These turtles are raised at the zoo, they're hatched at the zoo, and then they have two really, really good years at the zoo. They, they have such an incredible diet. And then uh, we return them into the park, into wetlands where, they, where their ancestors would have traditionally lived. And we're building up that population again, slowly over time. I think one of the things I, I love best about the park is its agricultural uh, heritage. And we actually have a mandate to promote a vibrant uh, farming community. Um, the park is rich in its soils. It's home to predominantly class one soils, which are the richest, rarest, and most fertile in Canada. And the park is already home to a number of pick your own operations, uh, strawberry uh, farms where you can go and pick your own strawberries. Uh, and, and a whole host of other amazing agricultural uh, opportunities. And that's just gonna grow and build over time. We just closed a couple of weeks ago, our first ever uh, request for interest for, for new farmers uh, in the park. So we, we, uh, we've we uh, found a seven acres of, of vacant farmland attached to a farmhouse. And we're gonna renew uh, farming for a generation in, in, in the park by bringing in new and urban farmers into the park. Uh, and and we we were blown away with the with the interest interest in this opportunity, and the hunger that there is uh, for urban farming uh, opportunities. That's a picture of me and my daughter, who's now three, almost three. And it's our annual tradition to go pick strawberries uh, in in the park, and it's it's just amazing because there aren't that many farms left in this area. In fact, we have the last remaining working farm in the city of Toronto that's actually protected in in the park. So we really uh, value that connection to food and where food comes from as well. Park is home to uh, over 200 uh, houses and residents. Some of them have heritage values. So we actually work uh, with heritage architects to try to preserve as much of that heritage as we can. Unfortunately, a lot of the buildings that transferred to us, they hadn't been maintained in 40 or 50 years. Um, so. We, we're not able to save every building, but we certainly put our best uh, effort forward to, to do the, the best that we can with, with the built heritage that we have in the park. Part of that work has included uh, investing in skills development. So we have been uh, investing in houses and in some cases repurposing them. We've given one to, to um, a community group that helps vulnerable populations to find them supportive housing, but all the work that was done to uh, refurbish the house uh, was done by local um, uh, skills, uh, but by a local organization that works with uh, populations that have perhaps barriers to, to accessibility, uh, to access the, accessing the job market and skills, skilled trades. So they did all the work themselves and they were learning on the job, uh, but it was, it's, a, it's a really great group building up that we were working with. And now this house, which otherwise would have been torn down and decommissioned has been renewed for a generation and is supporting um, at-risk populations uh, and, and is a form of supportive housing in the park. So that's a small way that we're trying to give back where we have these houses that we, we don't have funds necessarily to invest in. I think the other thing that's really like uh, important in terms of how the park is building itself up is the the local uh, community economic impact. So when we, when we look at uh, the economic impact of national parks and parks kind of places across the country, it's calculated to be, to, to contribute to over $4 billion to Canada's GDP. Uh, and that, that's a combination of parks Canada investments as well as visitor um, spending. So that's $2.5 billion in, in labor income uh, and $532 million in tax revenues that were generated uh, the last time this was calculated about two years ago. And about 40,000 full-time equivalent jobs uh, were supported across the country from our sites. Um, in terms of uh, the local situation, well, we know that our, our parks get places uh, provide over $266 billion in, in ecosystem services from coast to coast to coast. This is a really coarse estimate because it's, it's really hard to, to calculate in fact, it's impossible to truly calculate, and in, in some ways meaningless to calculate the value, the economic value of, of, of what nature provides us. But that's kind of our attempt. And um, you know, ecosystem services include pollination, stored carbon, 
flood controls, food production, soil formation, clean air, and many more. In a 10-year-old study uh, from 2012, the David Suzuki Foundation estimated that the Rouge provides over $115 million per year in eco ecosystem services and economic benefits. Now, we've adjusted that in light of inflation. Everyone's talking about inflation these days, and that's over 144 million. I think that's a very uh, extremely conservative uh, kind of insight as to the, the value of these lands from an ecosystem service perspective, but it's the best measurement that we have uh, to date of, uh, of the value that these lands uh, have provide from an ecosystem uh, services perspective. I think like locally what this means in terms of opportunities for folks, um, I mean, we are right now really focusing on putting in place the foundational infrastructure that if you build it, they will come sort of idea uh, of putting in trails that really connect people. And we know um, the return on investment uh, from a study in Dallas uh, a few years ago is that there's a seven to one return on investment for every dollar spent on park development. We know this to be 50 to one in the case of trail development. And right now our primary focus is connecting the park from north to south, east to west, we're opening 22 kilometers of new trails in the park just this year, and so we, you know, th these trails are the lifeblood of of the park, not just for for hiking and walking and visitor ex experience opportunities, but for connecting communities as well as for having uh, promoting the the future of the park in terms of uh, new farming opportunities. People will be able to sell food off off their farm to adjacent hikers walking by uh, their, their farmland and, and really uh, contributing to, to the full vision and, and possibilities of this park over, over the long term and really building community in that way. So that's something we're really uh, building towards slowly, organically, uh, trying to do things the right way and plan it properly. So the things that we're currently working on building are our flagship visitor center. Um, which is being built by um, Moriyama and Tashima Architects of Toronto. They've built the Aga Khan Museum. They built the Canadian War Museum. Um, they're brilliant architects and we're just so um, fortunate to be working with them. We're working on a number of restoration projects and putting in place basic trails and amenities. Um, we're trying to invest in green infrastructure. So our, our, uh, our visitor center will be um, net zero and uh, lead environmental design. Its future location is across the street from the Toronto Zoo for folks that are familiar with the area. It is the most appropriate place to have this kind of um, development. So it's gonna be built on a disturbed former uh, naturalized parking lot that the zoo um, had, no longer requires and, and was happy to make available to Parks Canada. And we're very grateful for that. It's also connected to the grid, uh, below ground infrastructure, and it's in a very strategically uh, ideal sort of location in terms of being in the Toronto area of the park, being connected to public transit, being connected to highways um, and across the street from the Toronto Zoo. And of course, um, there are many design principles that are very important. These are some of the same design principles that we have for the park, including leading in environmental design and co-design with our indigenous partners. So there, there's a lot on the go right now. I think when you create uh, any new protected area and particularly a national urban park, there's a lot that goes into that, like in terms of everything from picking up the garbage to carpentry, to architecture, to of, of course, biology, in this case, farming opportunities, uh, indigenous economic benefits. I mean, it, it's, it's a massive project and a, really the honor of a lifetime to be able to work on it. Um, but there's so many uh, short-term, I think, local economic and community benefits that are important to highlight. And then the long-term, I think, because we're not, we're trying to do this properly, go slow, not over-promote the park, try to build things and make sure that we have, um, that we're building properly for the future so that when more people come, that they're coming more sustainably, that we have the right infrastructure in place to support them. But there's a tremendous amount of potential and opportunities in the future for uh, heritage tourism, bed and breakfast, uh, different camping experiences, all in a way that's authentic and appropriate and in the spirit of our management plan. And, and, uh, and we hope to be as sustainable as, as can be by trying to do things properly, plan properly, and, and build uh, for 
for the many, many generations to come. Um, and so that's really a luxury that we've been afforded and that we're very thankful for that we've been able to try to do this properly. So that's, that's a short overview for me and thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Omar.